As we dive into scripture this morning, will you please join me in prayer? Loving and gracious God, we are thankful for your word and for the truths your words speak into our lives. Right now we ask that you'd give us ears to hear what you have for us. And God, I ask that you would take my words and use them for your glory. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So starting at verse 15, John 21, last chapter of John, we read this. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, then feed my sheep, tend to my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grew older, you will stre- when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. He was the one who had reclined next to Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? And Jesus replied, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is it to you? Follow me. So the rumor spread in the community that this disciple would not die, yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is it to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them. And we know that his testimony is true, but there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So believe it or not, I was one of those kids when I was growing up. One of, one of those kids, you all know this type of kid, especially if you've been a teacher, if you've ever been in an elementary school to see your kids. Do we have any teachers here this morning? A, cu- a couple of teachers. So I was, I was one of, one of those, those kids. I, um, in kindergarten, was the, the kid who took the tricycle and rode the opposite way around the circle. You know, the circle went one way. I said, no, no, I'm riding the other way. Uh, in third grade, third grade was the first year that I had to sit by myself at a desk. My, my desk mate was actually the class snake. I think that's where my fear of snakes started. Um, but, so I had to sit by myself because I would just talk to everybody and talk to everybody. By the time I got to fourth grade, um, fourth and fifth grade weren't, weren't necessarily bad. I was the class treasurer in fourth grade, a position I won by rapping to my classmates. And then in, in fifth grade, another, I rapped again. I was back for my second rap. I was the president in, in fifth grade. So I wasn't always the kid who got in trouble. I wasn't always the, the, the kid who um, wreaked havoc. But a lot of times that, that was me. And I'm fairly certain I drove the staff and the teachers at my elementary school a little bit crazy. And and a big reason for that is because my mom was on staff at the school where I went to elementary school. My mom was a teacher. And so I knew how to push the buttons of her friends because I spent time with them outside of the classroom. That's my my dad and and, and my mom and me in fifth grade and my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Fleet, with me right at, at graduation or promotion. It's called elementary school. So because my mom was at my school, she was never that far away, which was good when I wanted a quarter for chocolate milk. But when I got in trouble, it wasn't always a good thing. One of my most memorable stories from elementary school uh, happened in fifth grade right about this time of, of year, 27 years ago, as, as the fifth, grade, fifth graders are getting ready for the end of the school year festivities, you know, things like, like pizza parties and things like uh, teachers versus students softball games, all those sorts of things. So we were getting ready for that, and there's maybe three weeks, four weeks left in, in, in school, and uh, it was PE time, and so we had to go out on the field for, for PE. And the PE teacher was, was named Mrs. Emerson, and she asked our class to, to run a lap, to run a lap like you always do in PE, to run a lap before we got to go play kickball. 
And so my friends and I, we were super eager because we, we just wanted to go and play kick, kickball. So, so three of us, we, we ran the first lap. We ran the lap, and then she said, once we got to her, well, the rest of your class walked. And because the rest of your class walked, you need to run another one. And so we kind of jogged away from her and said, oh, really, Mrs. Emerson? And then we kind of got slower. And then the rest of our, our classmates walked up to us. And about halfway around our second lap, I had this, this brilliant idea. And I shouted, let's strike! And I got the entire fifth grade class to sit down on the grass. She was absolutely furious, and she came running out. She said, guys, get up, get up, get up, but we didn't get up. And instead, we started chanting, hell no, we won't go. <laughs> and my ear still hurts when I think of my mom and the principal storming across the field to pull me into the principal's office. Yeah, not one of my brighter moments. Um, and as a punishment for leading this strike, um, I was not allowed to participate in the end of the year pizzas party. I was not allowed to participate in uh, the, the staff versus student softball game, which I had been looking forward to since I was in second grade. Um, and my mom stood firm. She stood firm. She said, you know, your, your punishment has to, has to meet, or your punishment has to meet what, what you did. It has to fit, fit the crime. So it still bugs her when I tell this story. When, when I tell this story and, and I say, Mom, you realize that that was the first time that I ever remember experiencing grace. Because at some point during the, the pizza party, the pizza party was going on, I was sitting in Mr. Fleet's classroom, I was bummed, and in comes Mr. Fleet and he says, hey, why don't you go and join your classmates? Why don't you go and, and, and join your classmates? And so it still bugs her that I say, yeah, it's the first time I remember experiencing grace. I'm sure there's other times I experienced grace uh, as a kid, but it's the first time that I say, oh yeah, I deserve the punishment. I knew I deserved the punishment. I knew it. And, and still, for some reason, I was welcomed to join in with my classmates. And, and there is a bit of poetic justice uh, in, in this whole story. The, the PE teacher, Mrs. Emerson, um, years later, her son, when I was a high school youth director, her son walked into my youth group, and I got to deal with him for four years. <laughs> I actually, he's a great friend of mine. He's a firefighter in San Diego, and I officiated his wedding a couple, a couple years ago. But during this, this conversation between Peter and Jesus, we're, we're given a model for how a reconciled relationship looks. We're given this model of, of, of two really close friends kind of restoring their relationship with one another. Three times Jesus says, do you love me? Do you love me? And as Peter and Jesus go back and forth, we see that he's reinstated into a right relationship with Christ and with the other disciples as well. Now there's a lot that's going on in these, these final verses in John's gospel. And one of the truths that we see is that at least, at least for Jesus, when it comes to being a part of his church, when it comes to being a part of the community that claims to follow after Jesus, experiencing grace is an essential part of being a part of that community. Think, think about this for a minute. Peter, well, how else do we know Peter? He, he's, he's the rock. He's the one who built the church. And, and he couldn't have led the church without first experiencing grace. Without first, in, in some ways, without first experiencing failure. It, it were those things that kind of added into the way in which he, he led the church. One of the main reasons he was able to lead in the way that he was is because Jesus offered him grace. Jesus restored the relationship with him. And then Jesus asks him to lead his people. Again, the model that, that Jesus sets here as he reinstates Peter is, is one that we need to learn to adopt in, in, in the church today. We need to learn to, to, to emulate Jesus as we welcome people into our community. The first part, the first thing that we see in, in this reinstatement is that it's personal. Right before this conversation, what, what was going on? This is where you can toss out. What was happening right before Jesus had this really intimate conversation? I'll give you a hint. We talked about it last week. Fish breakfast. They're having a, they're having a fish breakfast. They're eating fish together, together as a group. And then, then Jesus pulls Peter aside. 
He pulls Peter aside and he says, hey, hey, come with me. I've got something to share with you. Notice that Jesus doesn't ostracize Peter in front of the group. He, he, he doesn't say, hey, remember that time that Peter said he was going to, you know, did you see what happened? He, no, he pulls them aside to have the conversation. And then as he pulls them aside, as he reestablishes their relationship, he addresses Peter with his formal name, Simon, son of John. Now, I'm guessing this, this is somewhat true for, for most of us, and, and maybe not, but in my family, when I grew up, if my father used my full name, I, I knew something was coming, right? David Kiff Rohde. I see you smiling back there, Sprague family. Is that true in your family too? I, I knew something w was coming, and, and you know what? It happens in my, my house too. Those things are generational, I guess. It happens in my house too. Ella Marie Rohde. It gets her attention, just like that. So, so I'll, I'll use her whole name when I'm trying to get her attention, usually when I'm trying to rebuke her. Usually when I'm trying to ask her to, to do something or, or to get her attention, but I'll also use it when we're, we're trying to have fun with one another. Maybe we'll be out on the playground or she'll be out riding her bike and I'll say, Ella Marie, one, two, three, let's go. We, we don't know how, we, we can't read the tone of Jesus' words in the text. But, but there is significance in knowing that, that Jesus used Simon's formal name, Simon, son of John. Simon, son of John. We can't know the tone, but there's significance in the way that Jesus reaches out to Peter. And as Jesus reinstates him, we, we know that it's serious enough for him to use his full, his, his formal name. And the first time Jesus asked Peter if he loves him, he adds this qualifier. He says, do you love me more than these? Well, who? More, more than these what? And he's referring to these, these other disciples. Do you love me more than these other disciples? Jesus gets straight to the heart of the matter. And it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty hard to know if you love someone more than, than another person. Like if, if any of my three kids, if we were to sit down and say, which one of you loves mom more? Probably gonna be a pretty interesting debate and probably not one that mom wants to be a part of. But eh, I, think, I think of young love, right? When, when, when Haley and I were in high school and we were just saying, I love you more. No, I love you more. No, I love you more. How do you qualify who loves another person more? And so here Jesus says, do you love me more than these others? Do, do, you, do you love me? And, and I think we have to remember what, what happened before Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, Jesus predicts that Peter will deny him and Peter's response is, uh-uh. I'm, I'm not going to deny you. Wherever you go, I am going to. Whatever's in store for you is in store for me. Even if everyone else turns their backs, I won't. I won't. And so here, in a way, Jesus is saying, hey, remember when you made that commitment? What happened? What, what, what happened to that commitment that you, that you made? In all four Gospels, we see places where, where Peter kind of tries to elevate himself uh, above the other disciples. And I think it's kind of funny because I think John does the same thing. He's the, the, the one who Jesus loves in his own writing. And so, but Peter kind of does this thing where he, he tries to elevate himself above the other disciples, where he claims that he's more loyal than the others, that, that, that he's, he's more committed than the others. And here Jesus says, really? Really, what happened? What happened? And the second time Jesus asks the question, he doesn't include the tagline of more than these, but you can see that it still stings. That there's still this, this sting, and it, and it just continues with the third time. It's obvious that Peter is hurt by Jesus' question. Now, there's a lot of debate among scholars about the word that, that, that Jesus uses for love or the words that Peter uses for love when they're having this debate uh, or when they're having this conversation with one another. Some scholars say, you know, it's significant in the way that, that phileo, which is brotherly love, is used, or agape, which is divine love, is used. Um, and, and some scholars say, you know what? They're synonyms in, in John's mind. He's using them inter interchangeably. But regardless of, of where that debate ends, I think it's important that we can see that Peter is, is tangibly hurt, that, that he is, is hurt by the questioning, by the way that Jesus approaches him. And it gets to this place by the end where, where he eventually blurts out, 
Lord, you know all things. You know my heart. You know, of course, of course I love you. It's a confession. It's a personal confession. Jesus, you know that I love you. You know me. He's also confessing his allegiance. I stand with you. You, you know that. And it, it leads to action. It, it leads to action. As, as Jesus welcomes Peter back into the fold, back into the community, he, he, he also asks him to do something. He's not told that, Peter's not told that he has to go and re-earn Jesus' trust or that he has to now somehow prove that he's worthy to, to lead Jesus' people. Right away, he says, all right, if you love me, here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do. Tend my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. He starts with this idea of, of feed my lambs, provide nourishment for the young. Take care of the young, provide nourishment for, for the, the young. Then take care of my sheep, or quite literally, shepherd my sheep. Keep my followers in line. Keep those, those stubborn followers in line. Correct them where correction is needed. And then feed my lambs. It's a combination of the first two. Now, I tend to think that we, we read sometimes too, too deeply into what Jesus is saying here, that we try to separate each one of those statements. And the, and the reality is, I just think this is a comprehensive picture of what discipleship looks like. Take care of everyone, from the young to the old, from those who follow easily to those who are stubborn. Take care of them all. Take care of them all. It's this, this picture of shepherding, this kind of overall picture, big picture of shepherding, but also discipleship. And the call that he places to Peter to be a part of that is the same call that's placed on the church today. That, that, that we are supposed to pay attention to what it looks like to disciple others. Loving Jesus and loving his people, they, they go hand in hand with one another. At the core of discipleship, that, that's what's there. Love God, love neighbor. That's what discipleship is, is all about. When we're driven to action, we become the catalyst for inviting one another from inviting others into restorative relationships with Jesus. So we, so we welcome people home. We, we reinstate broken people into community. In one way or another, we experience the, we experience the, the shepherding that Jesus is talking about here with Peter. And after Peter answers three times, Jesus gives us an honest assessment of what his reinstatement will mean. Hey, great, you're back in the fold, that's great. Here, here's, here's what's coming, here's what's coming. He says, if you follow me, it's going to cost you your life. There's all this buildup, two estranged friends coming together, being forgiveness, restoring trust, reconciling with one another, and then we, we kind of get this. If you follow me, it's gonna cost you something. It's gonna cost you your life. It's, 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 it's almost anticlimactic in, in, in that sort of way. Hey, you know what this means. If you're really going to live into what you claimed you were going to do when you said you were going to follow me, it's going to cost you your life. When Jesus invites Peter to lead his church, it doesn't come with this, this high praise. He's not saying, hey, you're going to be elevated. You're, you're going to be elevated. Everyone's going to follow you. He said, no, it's, it's costly. It's going to hurt. One commentary I read said that, that Jesus lays it out plainly here for Peter so that when Peter's difficulties came, when his trials came, when the martyrdom came for Peter, that, that, that Peter wouldn't think, oh, this is because I deny Jesus. That no, 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 it's not because you deny Jesus that this is happening. It's because anybody who follows me, it's, 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 it's costly, it's costly. And there Jesus assures him, you, you can't follow me now, but it's coming. It's coming. And after Jesus shares the news, Peter looks, looks over and he, he sees John, the one who Jesus loves. He sees John and he says, what about him? Is, is following you how it's gonna cost me, is it, is it gonna cost the same for him? What about him? And Jesus gives us this, this honest answer. If I want him to remain alive until I return, what does it mean to you? It's as if Jesus is saying, look, don't be concerned about where I stand with John. 
Be concerned about where you stand with me. Be concerned with yourself as you shepherd people. Follow after me, and I'll take care of the rest. As Jesus reinstates Peter, we're we're given this this model for for living as broken people who invite broken people into relationship. And in doing so, we, we get this wonderful opportunity as we shepherd other people, we get this wonderful opportunity to invite people into a restorative relationship with Jesus. And it's, it's something that's done that's, that's personal. It's something that leads to action. And it's something that's honest. One of the more powerful images that, that Jesus paints around reconciliation uh, is in the story, story, or I should say the parable of the, the prodigal son. Have any of you seen the, the I should have put it up, the, the, Rembrandt, the Rembrandt parable of prodigal sons? It was a very powerful, powerful image. And most of us know the story, right? That the youngest son runs away. Runs away and he blows all of his inheritance and then he, he comes back home and he says, if I, can just, if I can just be a slave or a servant on my father's farm, then that would be great. And, and, and as he's coming home and having these thoughts, dad runs out to him. Dad runs out to him and with open arms gives him a big hug and he says, welcome home. Throws a massive party, massive party, big, big brunch, big whole, whole nine yards. Pulls out all the stops. And then we have the faithful older brother who's been sitting there and stayed with his dad. He stayed working the farm, managing the farm, and he's bitter and he's angry. See, when we're at our best as a church, as ambassadors of reconciliation, which is what we're called to be, when we're at our best, we're like the dad who's running out and saying, welcome home. It's good to see you. We're glad you're here. And when the church is at its worst, unfortunately, we're like the cold and and bitter brother that is saying, what are you doing here? You you don't belong. Why are you here? This model that Jesus gives for Peter, he's embodying the, the parable of the prodigal son. He's saying to Peter, hey, welcome home. I'm glad you're here. Now go and feed my sheep. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for the call that you place on our lives to be ambassadors of reconciliation. And for the opportunity you give us to to watch people's relationship restored with you as we point others toward you. God, we ask that we would live out these words. We pray these things in your name. Amen.